Human progress is in decline. The UN's found that life expectancies, education levels and living standards have fallen in nearly every country. So what's behind that change and how can the trend be reversed? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the programme. I'm Adrian Finnegan. 30 years of continuous human progress is unravelling. That's the warning from the latest report on the United Nations Human Development Index. It's a measure of average life expectancies, education levels and living standards around the world. Since it was introduced in 1990, the index has increased every year until 2020. But the UN has now recorded two years of decline in a row. It means that we're living shorter lives, are less well-educated, and that incomes are going down. The pandemic, climate change, and the war in Ukraine have been blamed. The UN says that the world has been lurching from crisis to crisis over the past two years. The setback is global, affecting more than 90% of countries since 2019. The worst affected is South Sudan. People there live on average until they're 55 years old. Annual earnings are $768. At the other end of the scale is Switzerland. It's been a top performer since 2009. People there are expected to live into their mid-80s and they earn, on average, $66,000 a year. The UN says the situation could be improved by countries investing in renewable energy, preparing for future pandemics and ensuring against economic shocks. Al Jazeera's Heba Morgan has more now from Khartoum on why Chad, South Sudan and Niger are at the bottom of that list. When you take a look at the three countries at the bottom of the list, there are a few factors that they seem to have in common. Now, one of them is conflict. Those countries have been facing conflict for years now that has led to the displacement of millions of civilians, some of them being forced to cross the border into neighboring countries to seek refuge. The report also mentioned the impact of COVID on global supply chains and the impact of those countries at the bottom of the list. Some of them are already vulnerable because of the conflict and because of other disasters they were dealing with. Now, the report says that it has not looked into the impact of the war on Ukraine on those countries, but that that will likely have a more negative and deeper impact on those countries already at the bottom of the list and will have a, an impact on the mental health of the people living in those countries. Now, one thing it says that those countries also have in common is the impact of climate change. South Sudan, uh, for example, has been witnessing uh, floods for three, de three years now, and that has led to the displacement of tens of thousands of civilians and to the submerging of villages as well as to the loss of lives. Same thing has been happening in Chad over the past few months with villages being submerged and people losing their lives and people being forced from their homes to seek shelter on drier lands. Now the opposite is happening in Niger and that is drought that has affected the livestock and the livelihoods of people there. All these factors leading to, again, impact of the well-being of the people there, specifically on their mental health. Hiba Morgan for Inside Story. Let's bring in our guests for today's discussion. From New York, we're joined by Luis Felipe Lopez Calva, the UN Development Programme's Regional Director for Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, from Kuala Lumpur, Dr. Jamila Mahmoud, uh, Professor and Executive Director of Planetary Health at Sun Wan University. And from Nairobi, Charles Businga, Middle East and Northeast, uh, North and East Africa Director for Plan International. Welcome to you all. Uh, Luis Felipe Lopez Calva, let's uh, start with you. We live in a world of worry, begins the report. But we've always lived in a world of worry and uncertainty. What's new here? Humans have always been concerned about plagues and pestilence, violence and war, floods and droughts, to quote the report. What is significant about this report? Thank you very much, Adrian. Um, I would argue that what the report does in the best tradition of these human development reports is to try to uh, propose a, uh, uh, an idea of the state of the development in the world and quantifies some of the challenges. And I think the most important aspect now, what is different is that the Human Development Index, which is the measure, the synthetic measure we use to measure progress, for the first time in 32 years since the reports are published, has actually going down, has, has gone down. 
for the world uh, for two years in a row. Around 10% of the countries have a reduction in the Human Development Index. Now, 90% of the countries have a reduction in the Human Development Index. So there is a situation of a reversal in development massively for the world, but also uh, the report makes a, a very clear point about increased uncertainty. And we can talk later about what are the implications of this increased uncertainty. But I think it's important that we talk about the impact of COVID, the economic uh, crisis that followed COVID, and the recent cost of living crisis. But now the report quantifies and shows a magnitude of the impact. Dr. Javela Mahmoud, what struck you most about this report? I think, first of all, I want to congratulate UNDP for this really remarkable report, because for the first time, I think, well, it, even in the last report, but what it does is it positions the danger of the Anthropocene in the now very uncertain complex, uh, which is a very welcome, welcome uh, report. And it, it gets us to start looking at how, you know, the, dot, the dots are now joining and how that impacts people's lives. At the end of the day, it is about you know the human population, not just in terms of health and all that, but also the stress it's con it's causing, and almost the paralysis and powerlessness that people actually feel. And I think we we have to now say that you know we are in this complexity that is cascading, that is colliding, and we've got to find a way out of it. Dr. Jamila, nine, nine in ten countries uh, slid backwards. Uh, on the, the UN Human Development uh, Index in either 2020 or, or 2021. Forty percent of them fell in both years. Uh, what's led to such an unprecedented decline, do you think? I think this has been something that has been building up, but we know we are living in the Anthropocene. It is actually human behaviours, and but there's the rate at which you know this decline is happening which is very alarming added to that you know we've had a, a couple of very severe and you know major crises not just the pandemic but also you know you've mentioned the ukraine the the you know the polarization of the world that is not helping you know political leadership to find solutions we have a very polar, polarized world um and you know in, in the middle of that people are stuck the, and the multilateral institutions are also stuck because, you know, you can't find that clear way out. And I think we need a global leadership now to be at its finest. Charles Businga, South Sudan, Chad and Niger, as we reported, are at the bottom of that list. And, and you heard our correspondent Hibber Morgan saying that a common thread there is conflict and natural disasters. Uh, what do you think makes these countries so vulnerable? Is it just that or... Does leadership, good leadership, come into it too? Uh, it is a, a combination of different factors. And as we have heard, we are talking about these countries coming of COVID, conflict, um, extreme weather conditions, and the, also the global impact of the energy crisis. So they are not specifically uh, safeguarded from all these crises. And the, when that is combined with bad governance, that uh, enhances the and it reduces the capability of these countries in addressing some of these. As we have also seen from the report, that the crises are, are feeding off each other. And that is a reality the, that enhances the vulnerability of uh, the populations that are in those countries. And that significantly impacts on some of the populations like women and children who will uh, face the brunt of uh, those kind of situations. What impact, Charles, will the war in Ukraine have? I mean, that's happening a, a long way from most developing nations, particularly in Africa. But what impact will that war in Ukraine have on developing nations that are already struggling to, fall, uh, to deal with the, the fallout of, of, of the pandemic? Yeah, the, the war in Ukraine is, as we have already seen, um, in most of our countries, has impacted on the rise in food prices and fuel prices, and the making many of these countries unable to meet their fuel needs and their food needs. So it has compounded the already existing uh, bad situation for some of these countries. 
We've seen the impact of supply chain uh, conditions, which has resulted into um, many of the countries not being able to have access to some of these uh, re food requirements. And we've seen that in North Africa, for instance, where most of these who have been dependent on uh, wheat from Ukraine and Russia have been impacted by this. And that, as I said, has had significant impact on women and children. Luis Felipe Lopez Calvo, when the report talks about a decline in human development, what exactly does it mean? Well, the Human Development Index uh, combines three aspects. One is income, the other is education, and the other is uh, health, uh, measured, for example, by a specific indicator, which is life expectancy. One of the main shocks uh, uh, in, uh, in this indicator, of course, there was a shock in income and, and the impact in, in education is still to be seen because they will have longer, uh, longer uh, effect, longer time effect. But I think uh, it's important to emphasize that life expectancy went down by almost two years. That, that is a lot in terms of what it, it had taken to countries to get to higher levels of life expectancy, which is typically um, uh, an indicator that, in a way, summarizes the state of many other social indicators. But I also want to emphasize that uh, we look in the report at implications, uh, not only uh, in terms of, of the economic uh, conditions for the people, but also social and political implications. I think this is very important because what we see is the lowest level of trust among citizens uh, because of this increased level of uncertainty and the fact that people feel that they don't have control over their own lives because there has been a series of shocks. And that also shows, and we saw and we see in the report, a, a very high level of political polarization. We, we, we so talk. We, we, yeah. um, no, carry on. Yes, please. No, I was going to say that when we move into the solutions, maybe something that you were going to follow up on. I can, I can uh, elaborate more on this, but we think about, uh, we propose three I's. Invest, ensure, and innovate. And we show um, cases of countries that have done that and, and are trying to uh, recover and that have done it faster. I can mention some examples. But, but, but uh, it, it, go, go the, investing yeah. in ensuring and innovating needs good leadership, doesn't it? I mean, the world is not exactly blessed with with the best of, 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 of leadership at the moment when we've got so many demagogue, demagogues, uh, the, the, po the political polarization that, that we're seeing uh, at the moment, that the, the lurch towards popularization. Uh, uh, the world is, is looking fragmented and, and is not coming together in, in the way that it needs to, to, to bring about what you propose. It is indeed a, a moment of high polarization and low trust, as we show in the report. We believe that both transformational leadership, as, which is what uh, you referred to, I think is very important, but also what we call uh, transactional leadership, in the sense that people have to come together. We have to create space for people to come together. And when we talk about investment, for example, investment in cleaner energy, investment in cleaner infrastructure, like Uruguay, that has invested in cleaner infrastructure and lost up 15 positions when we have the planetary uh, the index adjusted for planetary pressure. So we have Kenya that has gone up seven places because they have taken decisive action in terms of, of, of uh, uh, climate. We, we talk about insurance. We, go, uh, we mentioned the idea of going from social protection to social solidarity. We need to give back uh, to the people the sense of control over their own lives. And we believe that, yes, leadership is fundamental, but also a collective, a, a collective action, collective leadership in the sense of bringing people together. Dr. Jamila Mahmoud, are, are you confident that the world can come together to solve uh, problems that are, that are, I mean, let's face it, mutual? We're, we're all in this together. The report talks about the world lurching from crisis to crea crisis and, and creating layers of uncertainty. Um, how is all of that affecting people's general well-being, their mental health? What do we mean by an uncertainty complex? First of all, let me maybe look at the report and almost conjure this image when I read it that basically it's saying we are all go gone back to becoming developing countries. You know, uh, and everyone is now, you know, every every country is facing its own challenges. 
I think that, you know, on your question, can we do something about it? Yes, we were once in that situation. What did we do? What did we learn? What kind of leadership led the way for us to, to get out of that situation? All these things, these lessons, these stories, you know, we need to capture it again to navigate this uncertainty. And we're talking about, you know, the, uncert the uncertainties and the complexity, you know, and there are four elements very, you know, nicely described uh, in the report, which is uh, looking, you know, from different elements from economics to the Anthropocene and through, you know, the climate issues that we're facing and, and, and the individual level as well. So that issue around mental health is what I mentioned earlier that that you know people are subject to so much information and Louis you know I love this report but the one I that I would have added was information because there's so much information and disinformation that is really you know making people uh they're unable to really focus and find a way out because you get paralyzed and I, and I want to turn to the media, you at Al Jazeera, 250 million viewers in, in 140 countries. What can media do now to help us? How do we get the stories out? How do we have a shared narrative of a common world, of a planet we need to protect, of humanity that we need to put in the center? This is what we need to do. We are faced with a planetary catastrophe. We have no choice. We can't give up. We need to push on. But it requires this transformation that is global, not at regional, sub-regional level. It's a global, global issue we all need to own and tackle together. And I think that all the speak that we've had on greening the economy and green transition energy, all that speak has to stop. We yeah. have to see action but, now. But how, but how um, uh, Dr. Mahmoud? I mean, it, it, it's, it's one thing to say we have to. We have to take action. We have, but how? The will has to be there. The people have to tell their leadership and the people have to also at individual level change the way they behave. I mean, OK, if you put politics aside in, in the world today, there's more stuff than the weight of the people on the planet. So the consumption patterns of humans, the behaviors on actually not even thinking twice when they're consuming energy, uh, the, the, the way we are putting up fossil fuel commissions without thinking about the damage that's being done, the way we skirt around the word climate emergency and go into to create you know, treaties that nobody pu puts through. So we as individuals need to rise and say at our individual level, this is what we need to do. And this is what we also need to demand of you know whether it's our government or business that you know if if people change the way they behave then there's we have a chance i'm not saying that it's going to solve everything but we have a chance now of actually trying to find that solution but if we go into an apathetic mode and we give up then that's the end and i think for me working at sunway university why we said that the planetary health center is to tackle it through a revolution in education getting our students to understand the decisions they make when they're out of university when they're at work will have serious implications on the planet will have will contribute to the complexity we're facing in the world today and we need young people now to be educated in a way that you know shows value of being of being a human being on this on the shared earth that we have Charles Pusenga, is it possible to put politics aside? We, we talked earlier about how issues of bad governance have, have, uh, have held back development in, in Africa. Uh, for instance, the, the report says that recovery from the pandemic has been uneven and, uh, uneven and partial, further widening inequalities in, in human development. Can you think of any examples to give us about this, this global divide that, that, that exists? Access to COVID-19 uh, uh, vaccines, for example, which which has this this political element to it. The vaccines are there and available. The world did a great job in in producing the, these vaccines to head off the pandemic, and yet not everyone can get them. Yeah, um, I think the the first fundamental issue is to be true to our commitments um, across. Uh, different uh, people across different uh, sectors, across different uh, groups, especially those in governance. I think there are moral issues here which need to be uh, looked into, and uh, we need to be able to 
look at these issues as global issues that will require global action. And, uh, and for me, uh, politics is intertwined there. It, it, we cannot just separate uh, these issues from politics because it is partly uh, some decisions which are made in some places which will have implications in other places. If we are talking about inequality, there are also decisions which are made by some individuals in power which will impact on those individual, other individuals who cannot make those decisions. So the inequality question comes at the center, which also requires a moral reflection, a moral discussion to, to move forward. We have been talking about pre-existing inequalities, uh, especially those which are driven by gender, uh, driven by race, driven by uh, other considerations, which we need to put into perspective and come to terms with. If we are going to look for solutions, we need to look for uh, collective solutions where specific uh, countries will definitely need assistance to improve on their governance uh, credentials, but also to address some of the issues that will require specific investment. And, the, and the, as the, I think the report says, we need to invest, we need to innovate, yeah. because the crises are getting complex. If we cannot be able to innovate, if we cannot be able to invest um, uh, as a collective, we are going to remain uh, in this situation, even getting worse. Luis, Philippe lopez Calfa, I, I, I want to end the programme on, on an optimistic note, but I'm going to start with a with a a negative question before I, I ask you what, what some of the positive takeaways are from this report. Um, Dr. Jamila Mahmoud was saying that people need to demand action of, of their governments, but how can they in some of the world's more authoritarian states? I mean, that's, that's not exactly an, an option that's open to them, is it? Yes, I think um, the report actually ends uh, in a, in a way, uh, after assessing all these polarization, the lack of, uh, you know, democratic uh, instruments in many in many, many places, um, the the rise of certain types of leadership that are not conducive to bringing people together, I think all that is is described very clearly and and um, in the report. But also, but one of the main messages is this idea that there is there is opportunity and uncertainty as well. The three eyes are not just a, a way to say. Uh, uh, let's have some nice uh, landing of the report. I think the idea of investing in every context, the idea of how we define it, what is the investment that we need to uh, to transition to to a more um, inclusive and sustainable development path, or the idea of solidarity. But I want to say, if I may, uh, there are international instruments. Certainly, the 2030 agenda, which we always say, it's a, it's a way to try to move from ideology to ideals. We have the Paris Agreement. Let's try to work hard to turn them into instruments to bring us back together. At the national level, we have a region like, like the American, the Caribbean, that even the last two years have had, has had a, a super cycle of, in terms of the number of elections. And people have chosen to process the, the, the tensions through democratic means. And at the, at the personal level, and I want to appeal to what you mentioned before, it's a call also for individual leadership. Everybody has, in a way, a space to take control and, and be innov innovative. And the, the I about innovation is about social innovation. It's about uh, everybody becoming a leader in their own community and trying to propose solutions. And there we must end. I'm afraid we're out of time. Thank you so much for being with us. Luis Felipe Lopez Calva, Dr. Jamila Mahboud, and Charles Businga. And thanks to you for watching. Don't forget you can see the programme again at any time by visiting the website at aljazeera.com. For further discussion, join us on our Facebook page. That's at facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. And you can join the conversation on Twitter, our handle at AJ Inside Story. From me, Adrian Finnegan, and the team here in Doha, thanks for watching. We'll see you again. Bye for now.